Welcome to module three video lecture series. Uh, this is the first video lecture on module three. I'll be talking about the general concepts of the module, how many videos it's been broken to, and what the underlying concepts are behind the studying of non-constant coefficient differential equations. Um, I've broken the lecture into uh, four videos. So the first one is the one I'm giving you right now. We'll be talking about the general concepts, terminology, and what non-constant coefficient differential equations are and how they're solved. Module 3, video lecture 2, will focus on giving you the two different types of points that your power series solution could converge to, known as ordinary and singular, or not to, known as ordinary and singular points. The next uh, video lecture will be on solutions about ordinary points, and the last one will be solutions about singular points. So that will do it for our discussion of uh, non-constant coefficient differential, equ uh, differential equations. Now, introducing you to non-constant coefficient higher-order differential equations uh, requires a review of power series, so I'll be introducing you to the concept, and I'll also be doing some basic review of power series and taking you down the memory lane of second semester calculus co course you had. To give you an idea as to what this thing is all about, in uh, module two, we were we encountered differential equations such as two say y double prime plus seven y prime minus five y equal to cosine of t, and this was a second order constant coefficient differential equation. And the theory suggested that all solutions to differential equations with constant coefficients would be of some sort of an e to the power of m, or there'll be some sort of an exponential solution known as closed form solutions, and we verified that those are indeed fundamental solutions, and you could generate the solution of all non-constant co uh, constant coefficient differential equations using these exponential functions. At the end of module two, we introduced you to a very special type of a non-constant coefficient types of differential equations known as Cauchy-Euler, which indicated Cauchy and Euler that if you could have a differential equation that does not have constant coefficients. However, the power of that, of that constant, which in this case happens to be a variable, if the power of that term happens to match the order of the derivative that it's with, then we can consider that to be a part of Cauchy-Euler equations, and we don't need to go to power series solutions. There's a way you could actually assume a solution and then verify that that indeed is a solution and then write the solution using the same type of characteristic equation you used for the previous type differential equations. For example, if you add x cubed y triple prime plus 7x squared y double prime minus 8x y prime plus 3y equal to 0, this would have been a Cauchy-Euler. You'd written a characteristic equation for this, and you would have written the solutions in general as y equals x to some power of m. So here we would have seen that all solutions could be written in terms of polynomials and also logarithms as well. Now, what if I have x cubed minus 1 y double prime minus 7 x squared y prime plus y equals 0? How would you solve a differential equation like that, where the power of the coefficient is different than the order of the derivative? And that's what we're going to focus in this chapter. We're going to assume that these types of differential equations will be solved by guessing at solutions that look like an infinite power series, a naught, a1x, a2x squared, plus so on. And if you recall, you could have written these as sum of a n x to the n, as n goes from zero to infinity. And that's going to be our solution for such equations. So obviously and naturally, what you need to calculate in these or figure out in these solutions is these a n's. Because if you knew these constants, then you know the actual solution, and then you do have the solution to this differential equation in terms of an infinite power series or in terms of a polynomial. All right, now, in order to do that, we're going to, as I said, going through the memory down memory lane for second semester calculus. I'm not going to be teaching you Calc 2, but I'm just going to just drive through it to remind you of the important things you need to remember to be able to do the calculations for this chapter or for this module. Now remember Taylor's polynomial, uh, you remember how to write it, and the idea was approximating functions. Now there is an inherent misunderstanding with uh, 
with the concept of Taylor polynomials and when you're actually trying to approximate a function f of x by a Taylor polynomial, a lot of students that are studying this or learning it for the first time are under the impression that when you're trying to approximate a polynomial, a function with a polynomial, let's say Taylor's polynomial, then you're actually approximating that function. And that's such a misperception because what you're doing is you're not approximating the function. You're actually approximating the value of that function at a certain point. So if you're going to have a function f of x, then you will be creating the Taylor polynomial for that function, which approximates it. And what that, what that Taylor polynomial does is that it allows you to take some value x naught, plug it in this Taylor polynomial, which is an approximation to this function, and get an approximate value what, to what f of x naught would have looked like or would have been since you don't have f to begin with. So, so these power series expansion is basically just a way of being able to approximate the value of a function you don't know at a given point. Now, here I found a very, very interesting example, a picture that really depicts what these approximating uh, power series do. If you notice, if the function happens to be the frog, and uh, let me make it a little thicker. So if the function happens to be this frog, if that's the function, now notice that and at, at initial stages, like if you take the, the, just approximate a function using only the first term, it's a very crude approximation, you only get a constant to approximate the function. So you see, it only approximates the function at only one point. Now, if you take one more term or two more terms, now you're approximating a function with a quadratic, with the highest power of two, which means now you'll be dealing with some kind of a parabola of some sort. You see, now you're approximating the function at more than one point. Now you notice the more terms you pick, the, the better you'll be approximating this blue function by the red function. So ultimately, if you write all the infinite terms, that's when ultimately you'll be approximating the entire blue function with a red function and actually cover it all. So it's a very interesting um, presentation of what these uh, partial sums do. And the more terms you pick, the better you approximate the function. Anyway, just a, just a concept from second semester calculus. Now, of course, uh, you could use a Taylor polynomial to approximate a function. This is functional approximation. Again, has nothing to do with differential equations. I just want to remind you that you could have a function. They could give you some kind of a value, some x naught, and they're gonna ask you to, f to approximate that function using a Taylor series polynomial around x naught equal to zero. So you basically, write the power series expansion for P2, for Taylor's polynomial, and then you just find F prime of zero, F double prime of zero, like you just did here, and you just plug them in, and that's how you could actually find the function. And you could find the same function around X equals two. So it's very easy to approx find the approximating polynomials to a given function. You just take derivatives and substitute them, if you remember. And I also actually plotted the whole thing for you because the red was the function itself. And then you had an e to the x, and then you had a 1 plus 0.5x plus 0.125x squared. So as, <coughs> as, the, as the number of terms increases in your function, you have a better approximation for your function. And here, I'll put the mathematical command you could use to actually see all three graphs on the same grid if you're interested. So... I've given you another example here that I've asked you to find a 50 degree Taylor polynomial for sine of x. So you could go over this again to just refresh your ideas of what happened in second semester calculus. And here are the codes for you to be able to graph those solutions or approximating functions uh, on using Mathematica. Now, it turns out that interestingly, you could also use Taylor's polynomial of nth degree to approximate solutions to simple differential equations. And some of you might have seen this in second semester calculus. Of course, we're not going to solve our non-constant coefficient differential equations this way, but I just want to show you how it works out. So you have a differential equation. You must be given an initial condition. So you find y prime of zero because you could, because you've been given that. Then you can find y double prime of zero by taking just the derivative of this differential equation. And then you can also find y triple prime of zero. 
So you could find these cons at zero, and then you can evaluate all of them at zero. So you basically have the numerators of the approximating polynomial, which is going to be considered to be the solution. So you just plug them in and you have a solution. I mean, it's really, really simple to use this concept to solve a differential equation. Now, again, as I said, that's an interesting concept to do, but our differential equations are not going to be that simple. They're going to be higher order differential equations. And... You're not going to have y prime equals f of x, y. You can only do this if you have a y prime equals to f of x, y type scenario. So you could then keep continuing to take more derivatives. But if, but if you have a higher order differential equation, then you can't do that. So let's move on to, again, just introducing you to some more notation. Power series in x minus a is an infinite series of this form. So it could be written as c0 plus c1 plus c2 and so on. This is centered around A. So such a series also is known a power series centered at A and it's defined as such. I'm sure you remember that. Now, how do you take a derivative of such a power series? Well, if you take a derivative, it, it, it works just like the power rule. The power N here comes down as a coefficient and you subtract the power by one. The only thing you need to be, and, and the constant is untouched. The only thing you need to be careful about is remember, that when you're starting at n is equal to zero and you're taking one derivative, then you kind of really don't need to start at zero again. So you can just move up the index by one unit when you're taking derivatives. And when you're taking a second derivative, you move it up by one unit, so you go from one to two. So don't forget, the differentiation process is just like a power rule derivative process, but you have to remember that when you take these derivatives, you have to change the index, the summation index. Very good. Now, and also I just wanted to remind you of the meaning of the word analytic, that we say a function is analytic at a point A, if it could be represented by a power series centered at A. And if you really, really, I mean, I could really stretch this definition to really make you like intuitively understand it's really not very mathematically precise, but you could also think of an analytic function as a function is like that's differentiable at A, almost, continuously differentiable at A. So it basically means the power series converges at that, a, at that point. So just uh, take that with a grain of salt. We're not going to push that word a lot, but just so you know what analytic means. Now, to be honest with you, the most important thing here, besides knowing and remembering how power series were written uh, and taking their derivatives, is to be able to add two summations that have different indices and their variables start at different powers. That's going to be something very important that you need to be doing throughout the entire process of finding solutions to non-constant coefficient differential equations. So let's just focus on this. Now, how do you add two power series that have different variables that start at different powers and the indices are different? So basically, what can I do? So at the end, they end up with the same index and they end up with the same power of x. What do I do for that to happen? Well, it's a procedural process, so you just have to remember, here's what you do first. You take the start point of each power series, and you plug it in for the power for x. So if n is equal to 2, I'm going to replace this n here with 2. Now if I replace n with 2, 2 minus 2 is 0, so, you got, so I get x to the power of 0. Now if I do the same thing with the second one, I take the first number that the summation starts with, which is 0, and I plug it up here for n for the power of x, I get x to the power of 1. Now, here's what you do. You take enough number of terms out of the lower powers until you reach the highest power of x in that summation. So, so since here I have two terms, and the highest power of x is 1, therefore I need to take x to the power of 0, and I need to remove a term from it so that it becomes 1. So that's the first thing you want to do. For any process of adding any kind of a power series. You plug in the initial index into the power of x and then make sure that you take out enough constants so that you every x in this summation reaches the highest power that it has in the summation. So now if I take, so I'm gonna erase all this redness here so you know what's going on. So I'm gonna erase all this redness so I could, no, don't worry, I'm not erasing the whole thing. So now, Let's start with uh, seeing what happens. Now, I need to take this term and I need to take a term out. So I need to take n is equal to 2 out. 
So I replace n in this power series with 2, and I pull it out. So if I replace the first n with 2, I get 2. If I replace this n with 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. Cn n is replaced with 2, so it becomes C2. And x to the power of n minus 2 is replaced with x to the power of 2 minus 2, which is x to the power of 0. So now I've taken the zero term, the first term out, which is n is equal to 2. The next term is n is equal to 3, so I just rewrite the same power series here. But now you notice if I put 3 in the power of x, I'll get 3 minus 2, which is 1, and it will match the 0 if I put it here. I get x equal x to the power of 1. So you see now the power of x matches. And that's what you need to do. You need to take out enough constants, enough terms, out of the power series until the powers match. All right, so that's the first thing you need to do. Let me erase this. You could always rewind and see what I did. So I don't want to mix the notation and the numbers. All right, so, so you've made sure, so now we're at this stage, and at this point, you notice that the, the power of the variable match. They're both x to the power of 1 if you plug in the initial index in there. Now we'll accomplish that, but we still need to make sure that the indices are the same, and ultimately the powers are the same as well, even though they match, but one of them is n minus 2, the other one is n plus 1. Remember, I want both of them to be the same. So here is when you play the game of give and take. I hope you remember that. So meaning that you either, uh, and it's always the opposite. So you, if you take from the index, you have to give to the argument. If you take from the argument, you have to give to the index. So somehow you have to decrease this or increase this and do the opposite to the argument and do the same thing to the other two pieces here until you get them to all be the same. So it's just a game. How, how, many, how many numbers should I lower the 3 and increase the n inside to match this one here? So let's see if I could do that and see how that's accomplished. And I'll do a lot of that as we're doing examples down the road. So what I'll do is, let me see. Now, if I take this n equals 3 and I lower it by, uh, let's say, 2 units, that becomes n equals 1. If I lower this by 2 units, that means I have to take the argument, which is all this, and I have to increase it by 2 units. So I'll take n and increase it by 2 units. It becomes n plus 2. I take n minus 1 and I increase it by 2 units. It becomes n plus 1. I take c, to c sub n and I increase it by 2 units, it becomes cn plus 2. And I take x to the n minus 2, and I increase it by 2 units, it becomes x to the n. And then plus, now this one, now since I turned this into a 1, why don't I turn this 0? Since I turned the 3 into a 1 by lowering it by 2 units, I can turn 0 into a 1 by increasing it by 1 unit. So since I'm going to increase the index by 1 unit, I'm going to decrease the n in the argument by one unit. So c sub n becomes c sub n minus 1, and x to the n plus 1 becomes x to the n, and oh my god, my indices are the same, and my powers are the same. So now I can combine the two power series and write that. So you need to practice that a lot, so you could do that a lot with, with, uh, with any given summation of a bunch of power series. So practice that, practice that, and practice that. This is one of the most important thing you need to learn how to do because that's how you start the solution of all the problems in this module. All right, we'll now move on to our second lecture.